the Fosters, my family. Hope all is well. Okay, Mama, I see you. Frank Fiorino, thanks for joining. Welcome to episode 61 of the Positive Impact Podcast, where we talk about all topics relevant to the game that I love. I am your host, Terrell Dozier, and tonight's guest is former UConn great and now player development coach, Mr. Talik Brown. Legend. Terrell, what's going on, my man? Everything's going well, man. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I was wait, I was I was wondering when was my shot gonna come, man. I seen <laughs> all these other coaches on, all these other players. I've been waiting for my shot. <laughs> nah, listen, that's a good it's a good look, man. Um <laughs> You know, it's it's good to want you know people of your status to be to be on. So I appreciate it, and you know it, it, it definitely it definitely means a lot. I'm a basketball I'm a basketball guy, man. From from a long time, I've watched a lot of people coming up, man. So you know, it's good to see you know guys who I watch, you know, what I'm saying, and, and coming yeah. up and, and seeing the good stuff that they're doing, and now having a a platform to get to um to get to talk to them. So first things first, man, was been a it's been a crazy year. 2000 has been a crazy year. How have you and yours been getting along during this during this pandemic? Uh, it's been crazy right now, you know. So me, my family, uh, my friends, everybody just been trying to stay healthy, just stay out the way. Just basically try to uh, develop a routine, you know what I mean? Because you don't want to just get stagnant while you're in the house, just watching TV all day. So basically try to have my little routine I got going on every day. Just continuous, continuously, just trying to get better every single day, basically. No question. So let's, um, you know, as I always like to do, man, I gotta, I gotta take it back to the genesis and and talk about Talik Brown growing up in, in 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 New York City and your first memories of of the game of basketball, something that's taken you so far in life. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I started playing the game. I was probably about like ten years old. And I just started playing it because all my friends was playing the game. And I seen them having fun doing it. So I just thought, like, maybe I could just get involved and just hang out with these, with them guys. So as time went on, uh, they used to just destroy me, laugh at me, crack jokes at me, everything. But as summers went on, I used to just, at night, in the dark, I was just working, just continually trying to get better, just improving every single day. And 
when when I felt myself starting to get a little better than my friends, like we wasn't at a high level at that time, I knew it was starting to get serious. You know what I mean? So um, I was playing a lot of street ball tournaments, Kenny Anderson tournament, because I'm from Left Rack City. And I met a guy named Vincent Smith, which this guy just basically changed my life. He's a Kenny Smith brother. He was the director of uh, AIM High, AAU basketball team. And he was basically just my mentor throughout my whole high school, junior high school career, college career. And I still basically still talk to him to this day. He like sure. basically just shaped me and made me who the man I am today. And then I just seen all the great players he was training and all the great things he was doing to people and people lives like Kenny Anderson, Kenny Smith, Kamani Jones, Kamani Young, uh, Sham Guard, uh, Ron Artest. I just seen all the great players around him. So I just wanted to surround myself around him. No question about it. It's funny that you bring up Kenny Anderson and Left Rack City. You know what I mean? So I got my Kenny Anderson showcase. Okay, on okay. Shout, shout out to my man Ian Cunningham <laughs> out there. I'm doing a good job with my man Chibs, man. So, <laughs> so yeah. So you know. So now you come from a lot of you know you know let you know when you say Left Rack City, like you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's a lot of basketball being played in Queens. And talk about, you know what I mean, like now, like you're getting up through your middle school years and, you know, talk about, you know, did you play for AIM High? Did you, was AIM High your AAU program or did you ever go to Riverside or Gauchos? Like talk about when you started, who you played competitive AAU with. So I played with AIM High my whole time because I just wanted to be loyal to them guys. And them guys was old school, you know what I mean? Vincent Smith, uh, Pierre Turner. Kev Jackson, them guys was old school, so you couldn't play with nobody else. Them guys would really punch you in your face, you know what right. I mean? <laughs> I remember one time we had a little workout. I walked in the gym. I had some gaucho shorts on. Vince almost killed me, man. Yeah. He tried to slap me, kick me out the gym. I learned my lesson from that day forward. <laughs> right, right. Nah. Gotta be, they was gotta old be. school, man. Yeah, they was old school, so I just basically stayed with them, and then uh, – once I started really progressing and taking my game to that next level, um, he knew, Vince knew, like, he had a great feel. So he knew, you know, I had, like, outgrown the program. So at that time, he had moved down to Houston because Kenny Smith had set him up straight with a house in Houston. So he was living down there and everything. So I used to go out to Houston every summer to work out with him, just improve my game during the summer times once we had a little, got a little vacation from school. So when I went down there, they introduced me to this lady named uh, Miss Elaine Jones, and she ran a pro, a Nike team called Houston Jaguars. So when I got with them, that basically just changed my life because I was playing in all the top Nike tournaments. You know what I mean? So I was in uh, Orlando. I was in Peach Jam. We took, we won Peach Jam. This is before Peach Jam is the way it is now, but we won Peach Jam. Uh, we was in Orlando. We were just hitting all the Nike tournaments. And then I also did uh, Adidas camp. So I was just in the middle, you know what I mean? I didn't want to pick a side because I played with her at Nike and I played with Vince. And then my high school coach, uh, Jim Gatto, he was Adidas. So I used to always go to Adidas camp in the summertime as well. And then it was just uh, probably, I got to say, like my junior year. So through the rankings, we always came coming up. As a freshman, I went to St. John's Prep High School, right? So basically where Coach Jim Gatto was at, I went to St. John's Prep with the B Division school. Uh, in Queens, in Astoria. So I went there and started playing with Jim Gatto. But through my whole time coming up, like Omar and Andre, Omar Cook and Andre Barrett was always like ranked top high, high in the city. You know, they was the top two guards in the city since we was in eighth grade, basically. You know what I mean? So that was like my competition. So I didn't really know no other players because I didn't know the history of the game. But all I knew was them two guys. And I know I had to get to that level or be better than them two guys. You know what I mean? That was my that was my mindset. That's all I thought about. Like, I got to get to, to their level. I got to be better than these two guys. So they pushed me without even knowing it. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. So they was always ranked kind of high, as you know, since we were little kids. And probably about, like, my junior year, that's when I started really getting that notori uh, notoriety. And they started calling us the ho three, the Holy Trinity and the three guards. Because that junior summer, I just had a great summer. I had one Peach Jam tournament. I got the MVP and Chief Peach Jam. Uh, I had got the All-Star Game MVP at an ABCD camp. So I just had a great summer. And then after that summer, I basically had every school after me after that. 
Right. So you talk about, you know, you talked about, you know, I mean, touching on, you know, Andre Barrett, Omar Cook, and, and yourself that, you know, that senior year. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, New York City has always, always put out McDonald's All-Americans. Mm -hmm. Like, it really wasn't a McDonald's All-American game without a point guard from New York City. You know, you're talking yeah. about, you know, Kenny Anderson and, you know, I mean, Red Archery, Kareem Reed, like, the list goes on, Sham, you know what I mean? And now you got three of the top point guards in New York City. It was only right. And all three I played um, in the McDonald's All-American game. So, you know, you talk about guys pushing you. And I'm sure if I talk to Omar Cook and I talk to Andre Barrett, they probably was watching to see what you was doing, what you were doing too. So it's like iron sharpens iron. So, you know, Talk about your recruiting your, you know, your senior year. You said you had a great junior summer and everything mm -hmm. like that. So talk about your recruiting. And obviously, you know, you went on to UConn. But do you remember what it came down to between UConn and who and why you chose UConn? Okay. So before we before we even get into the recru recruiting, like uh, people don't know, like St. John's Prep, is a, it was a, at the time it was B division. So now you just say it's A division. So basically I was like the first, all American that came, ever came out to be the vision. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody really went to St. John's prep. Mm -hmm. And it was a guy there named Larry Jennings at the time. And as an eighth grade, I was always kind of thinking ahead. So I, I, I was going to go to Malloy. That was my main school. I was going to go to Malloy, Kenny Anderson, Vince. Used Left Rack City. Right. Left Rack City. Right. So <laughs> I just wanted to follow the tradition. So that was right. my main school I was going to go to. But, I went and took a little visit to St. John's Prep. Then I got with the coach. Then they had girls over there. Then they said I could play varsity. So it was just like, oh, I got to come here. And they had a dude named Larry Jennings at the time. He was there. And he had, like, a lot of uh, low Division One schools on him. So in my head, I'm saying, all right, if all of those schools is on him, the Stony Brooks, the Quinnipiacs, if these guys is on him, then – maybe I could go there and get be seen and get some shine off of him, you know, and piggyback off of what he's doing, then I could take over the team. So that was my really my whole mindset, you know what I mean? So it really – and it basically worked like that. Once I got there my freshman year, uh, I played varsity. Um, Larry was basically the man. I was feeding him the ball, still getting my – still getting – scoring my points here and there, just running the team, doing what I got to do. And then once he left, I basically took over the program, you know what I mean? And that just basically, he I think he pushed me as well because he just got me ready and just taught me, just taught me what I had to do just by watching him. You know what I mean? So he pushed me to that limit and got me where I had to go from there. But once he left, I just basically took over the school, had a great summer, had a great junior year summer, and I basically had all the schools on me, such as UConn, uh, North Carolinas, the St. John's, UMass. So my top. My top five schools was uh, uh, UConn, UMass, Syracuse, Seton Hall, and uh, I had USC up there. That was probably like my top five schools. Okay. And so, you know, before before I get into my next question, got to give a shout out to my man Ben Gordon who jumped on here. You know what I mean? <laughs> former, another former UConn great and former teammate. Ben, good to see you. I still got to get you on here, man. So... So what made you choose UConn? I mean, at the time, you know what I'm saying, like, it always seemed like UConn every year was just kind of like just reloading with guards. This little this little school in stores, Connecticut, that would just always bring in, you know, the point guard position. Like, you know what I'm saying? So you're talking to Khalid el like, you know what I'm saying? And now you're kind of like next in line, you know, to do that. So what 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 put UConn over the top? I basically, I basically, when I was coming here, I just thought about it like my high school career. You know what I mean? It was just basically the same process. What, how many minutes I'm gonna play? Uh, who's around me? What I got going on? Um, the school situation? How far was it? How close was it? Uh, uh, facilities? Everything was just in place here. You know what I mean? It was close to home. Facilities was great. They had a great history. Great point guard tradition and coming up during that time when I was about to commit, it was Khalid Alameen here, like you he were saying, and I seen everything he was doing. So I said, oh, if he could do all of that, I could go there and do the same thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that was really my mindset, and I knew he was leaving, so I knew I had a shot to come in and start right away. 
and just basically learn from experience. And like you said, you came right in and mm -hmm. and played for a legendary coach and yeah. and, and Jim Calhoun and you know. So give me give me a give me a Jim Calhoun story. Like Ooh. we all know Jim Calhoun, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> you like you gotta be a certain type of player mm -hmm. to make it with Jim Calhoun. Like Jim yeah. Calhoun wasn't gonna cut you no slack and you the point guard, so he really wasn't gonna cut you no slack. So talk about it. like you a high school all American, you did all you know, you did your thing and now you coming in here and you kinda starting over. Talk about what it was like playing for the legend, Jim Calhoun. The GOAT, Jim Calhoun, he was just gritty. You know what I mean? You had to be mentally tough uh, when you played for him because he would tell you a whole bunch of shit, but you had to be, you had to just take it in one ear, let it go out the other, and just, you couldn't take, uh, you couldn't, um, uh, you couldn't really just get mad at his words and what he was saying. You had to just really sit down and listen to what he said and just and just take it in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he was just great, man. He pushed you to the limit. He got you tougher. Without Coach Calhoun, I wouldn't even have a great uh, professional career. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't because of him. Yeah. You know, he was just like a father figure to everybody. And one story is uh, he used to say to the guys, um, you, you, uh, you mother effers think you tough, right? And guys was just like, yeah, yeah. He was like, all right, let's go in the room and lock the door and see who was the first person to come out. <laughs> that was his thing. <laughs> yeah, listen. Listen, man. But, you know, listen, man. Hey, look, he got the best out of you, man. He built that program into yes. what it is. And mm -hmm. we kind of talk about, you know, we talk about Khalid el for you. But, you know, before Khalid come there, like, because there were so many great teams prior to you guys, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about Ben being on here, but, you know, Ben had to think about Ray Allen, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And then Ray Allen had to think about Rick Hamilton. So there was always somebody at everybody's position mm -hmm. who, you know what I mean, who you're probably always going to be compared to. So that team beat Duke in 1999. You know, you guys are kind of building something. You, Ben, Mecca, you know what I'm saying? And, you know... I think Karan was there. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's a great, when you talk about that, that, that's a great team. That's three, that's three pros right there. You know what I mean? And, you know, Anthony Roberts, like, you know what I mean? Like, the team was nice. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. all these people. And so you guys had something brewing and something and brewing and something brewing to, to like, yo, we loaded at each team and like everybody yeah. wasn't really one and done back then. So mm -hmm. he was getting guys, you know, at least, two or three years then. So you you had a chance to build something really, really good at UConn. But let's talk about your game for a second coming out of high school. So first thing you think about New York City guard, they handle the ball, mm -hmm. right? That's what they yeah. say. A yeah. New York City point guard will give up their girl before they give up their dribble. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're right about right? that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they can handle the ball in rush hour traffic. Like, you know what I'm saying? So all those, all those things. So that's what you had. You knew how to run a team. That, that's that's what a New York City point guard does. But the knock on Talik Brown is he can't shoot it. Yes. Okay. So talk about that. Like, you know, what what went into that in the game? I know you heard the whispers and stuff like that. Talk about how hard um, that you worked on your jump shot. Uh, it was totally different because high school, I was like, I was a flat out scorer in high school. You know what I mean? That's all I did was score, shoot the ball, like. I ain't, you know, it was just basically score in high school. But when I came here, I had to really reconstruct my entire game and just learn how to run a team, run a program, put people in certain spots, be a true leader, talk up, just be the second coach on the floor, basically. And that's what Coach Calhoun had taught me. You know what I mean? And as far as my jump shot, I, I at first, when I was when I was like freshman, sophomore, it kind of bothered me. But once I started getting a little older and I knew my value to the team and I knew what I brought to the team and I know what I did great, I knew what I could do great, I, I just put that to the side burner and just been concentrated on what I what I was great at, you know what I mean? And just work my butt off at my uh, negatives in my game, but I had to focus and be positive about all the great things I can do on the floor. I couldn't let that hinder me and bring me down and slump me down. As long as I know in my mind, that I was getting reps after reps, and I was in the gym every single day working my tail off. Nah, no question about that. And so, 
Let's talk about the moment when it came to fruition. Mm -hmm. Big East tournaments, which we know is like in the in the Mecca, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. In the yeah. Mecca. I'm back home. Every year you get an opportunity to come back home, not only when you play St. John's, but that Big East tournament we know is, is, is magical. It's magical, the history of the Big East tournament. And UConn's in the close game with, with Pitt, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, you guys are trying to put the game away and ball goes out of bounds, only a couple seconds left on the shot clock. And they give you the ball, the kid from Queens who can't shoot <laughs> yeah. from about 30-something feet knocks down a big three-pointer. Take me through the moment. Talk about how you felt after the moment, man, because I, I put the video out on IG and just the, the jubilation on you. It's almost not so much that you put the game out of reach, but that also had to be like, yo, this is for all the people out there who say I couldn't shoot the ball. Take that. <laughs> So take me through that moment. Take me through that moment. In that moment, I just it was just a close game the whole game. It was just a battle with us and Pitt. You know what I mean? It was double overtime. I think uh the uh the second overtime, Brandon Knight had uh he had hurt his he had hurt his knee or his ankle, right? So they took him out the game, then he came back in the game, he threw up a half court shot, it almost went in. Like it was just catastrophic the whole game, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when once it started winding down in my head, I'm like, oh, they about to give it to me. I got to just be ready and hit this. I was like, and the only thing I was really thinking about is Coach Calhoun. <laughs> I said, I got to hit this shot because he's going to kill me if I hit this shot. <laughs> oh, God, God. But That's no, I, but serve on a serious note, I just caught it. You know what I mean? I just remembered all the things I would remember coming up, shooting, holding that follow through, getting the ball up trying to get it over the rim, just all the little details, and threw it up there, went in, you know, God God, God bless him, God willing, I threw it up there, hit the bottom of the net, and it was just, after that, it was just a great feeling, you know what I mean, just to yeah. do it at home, yeah. like, even though I proved people wrong, like, mm -hmm. but just to do it at home, at Madison Square Garden, at yeah. the Mecca, this is what yeah. you grow up wishing and playing, like playing on your hanger hoop mm. in, your, in your room. You know what I mean? Playing, yes, shooting yes. with a sock on yes. the hanger. This is what you yes. grow up dreaming that one day will happen, you know? Mm -hmm. so it was a question. great feeling for me, you know? And then when I was and then when I was in school, me and the walk-ons, we used to play this game after practice uh, called NCAA, right? So uh, or one of the guys used to just throw the ball to half court, like, and we used to just bring it down, 32, 16, and he yeah. used to just try to keep mixing it up, you know what yeah. I mean, and give me different challenges. Throw it yeah. to the three-point line. We, you in the five, you in the eight now. Throw it to the half court. Make yeah. it. You in the final four. So I was just always getting prepared. That game always made me prepared for them tough moments, yeah. even though we were just playing the game, just having fun after practice, mm -hmm. you know right. what I mean? Yeah. Nah, no question about it. So big moment, big moment, huge moment. Mm -hmm. So then we know every March. Every March, everybody trying to win. There's one team. Well, it's 64 teams trying to go 60, trying to go six and up. You win six games, you get to hoist that trophy. Yeah. 2004, it comes together. You, Ben Mecca, mm -hmm. Tough Juice, six and up. Mm -hmm. You beat Georgia Tech, national champions. What kind of feeling is that? Because not not too many players come through college. A lot of players come through college, but a lot of teams and a lot of players don't get the opportunity, number one, to make the Final Four, let alone get to the Final Four and be the last team and be the last team standing. Mm -hmm. Talk about that feeling. Talk about the journey with your, you know, with your brothers that, you know, I'm sure y'all still talk about to this mm -hmm. day. I know they're still talking about it in Connecticut to this day, because Connecticut, you know, let's face it, you guys were the, the pro team in Connecticut. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. talk about that journey with your brothers. Uh, just, I just got to give it up to the coaching staff. You know what I mean? The coaching staff just put an amazing team together. You know what I mean? And we had seven pros coming off of that team. So it was me, uh, Ben Gordon, um, uh, Charlie Villanueva, Emeka Okafor, Josh Boone, 
Hilton Armstrong, Marcus Williams, uh, uh, Denim Brown went second round. Like the only two people that went overseas was like me and Rashad. So basically yeah. our whole team went professional. You know what I mean? Right. So right. the coaching staff just put an amazing team together and we just battled every single year. We would just battle and battle and battle and battle and trying to get better. But we felt ourselves getting better. You know what I mean? We felt like, because we went into the season number one and we knew like we had a shot. And as the season just continually went on, we just felt ourselves getting better, getting better, gaining more confidence. We just getting reps. And we used to sit in the locker room and talk about like, oh, we have a chance to win, win it all. You know what I mean? If everybody's just on the same page, you know, we're on the same path. Everybody do what they got to do. We got a shot to win the national title. Like, this would change everybody's lives in here. You know what I mean? So we used to talk about it. We used to vision it. So we could basically make it come to existence, you know? Mm -hmm. But we yeah. had a great team. Great team. Nah, definitely, man. And you and you threw some other names out there, man. Like, for so many years, you kind of led this nation in blocks, Hilton Armstrong. And mm -hmm. again, we're talking about that lineage, right? Yeah. So Mecca, then it was Hilton's turn, then it's Josh's turn. Like, you know what I mean? Then the beat like, came after. Like, there was always a UConn. There was always a line. Like, you know what I mean? That it was always the next great point guard, the next two guard, the next yeah. shot blocker. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then that that dirty guy, the Kevin Freemans of the yeah. world. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? The ones that, that, that do the dirty work for y'all. Like, you know what I mean? So... It, it, it was it was a great time for Connecticut, man. Whether you was from whether you was from Connecticut or not, like you nah. respected UConn um, on so many on so many levels. So, you know, great way to end off you know your career. Um, the draft comes, obviously, that's the dream since childhood. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. all American, like you know, you you you're knocking down all the goals. Major D one talent, national champion. There's that one goal though. Like I need to touch that. I need to walk across that stage and shake David Stern's hands, and and you went undrafted. Yeah. Um, talk about the disappointment of that. You know what I mean? Like we're gonna give some ups and downs, and we talked about a lot of highs. Talk about that um, that disappointment for you. Uh, I was I was kind of disappointed, but you know I, you got to be a realist when it comes to this situation of, and about your life and. A, about the next step you got to really know what's going on and be a realist and be engaged with everything that's happening so like i worked out for a couple of teams when i left when i finished school but i like knew like nobody was reaching out to me like that like i didn't i didn't feel it like when i was coming into school or when i was all american you know what i mean i didn't feel that so i knew like i'm gonna have to work to get there i'm gonna have to take another journey to get to my main goal you know what i mean mm -hmm. so after that happened, uh, I went to the CBA. I tried to go to CBA. Guys was getting 10 days. I'm just trying to continue work my butt off, continue getting better, just continue working. Summer League, I get with Summer I'm with the Bulls in the Summer League. I'm with the Wizards in the Summer League, with Washington in the Summer League. But things are just not working out for me. So I, I, I really, like I was saying, you had to be a realist. Once I went overseas, I just tried to make basically – make that my livelihood, you know what I mean? And just adapt to that overseas life and just try to make a living by playing overseas. And it was just great for me because I was I just love the game of basketball. You know what I mean? I do I'll do this shit for free, man. Right. Like, I right. love the game of basketball. I'm passionate about it. Like I've been playing it my whole life. I'm not gonna be no doctor, no lawyer. Like I love basketball. That's my yeah. thing. You know right. what I mean? So no matter if I'm overseas, minor league uh australia anywhere I'm, yeah. i just want to be around the game of basketball basically no question no question and i and i think that's a huge message um you know we live in a we live in a in a pro or bust world like you know what i mean it's almost mm -hmm. like you know like basketball players from the age of eight like you know what i'm saying like this is the dream now when yeah. you talked about being realistic right so how many players get a chance to be a high school all-american like you how many players get to be in the McDonald's game, be MVP of the round ball? Like, you know what I mean? So so the the numbers that 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 crowd starts getting a little smaller the higher the goals get. And you mm -hmm. talked about being realistic. I'm a all American. I played on the national championship team. Why shouldn't I feel like I'm about to be a first round pick? Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So but a lot of kids, they're not realistic. Like yeah. you said, like, and that's the word is realistic. And mm -hmm. a pro is a pro. 
whether yeah. I'm in the NBA, <laughs> yeah. whether I, I can make money overseas too. And I think we lose sight of that. You know what I mean? Just like kids get caught up in division one, two, or three. A college basketball player is a college basketball player. And there's players from all levels that's in the NBA right now. You know what I mean? It's about, some of it's about luck. It's about skill. But I think the thing that you touched on the best, and I, and I love how you worded it, is just being realistic. And if you love mm -hmm. the game, you'll play the game anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And Talik Brown doesn't feel like a failure because he didn't make the NBA. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It, yeah. Ain't, it ain't for everybody. It ain't, yeah, it for, ain't everybody. for everybody. And it ain't about being a failure. As long as you succeed in life, you're growing as a person, you're developing as a man, like you're meeting, you're connecting with different people throughout your life. Like the game of basketball has taken me everywhere, from Croatia to Greece to Turkey. I would never, I didn't know nothing about these places when I was yeah. in left rack. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I didn't imagine myself getting to experience these different places and different foods and meeting new people and meeting all these different religions and mm -hmm. just every single thing. You know what I mean? It was just a great experience for me. Yeah. And I couldn't, I, I wouldn't change it for the world, basically. No doubt about it. So you hang the sneakers up in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the feeling of, okay, basketball is done now. And now I got to make, I got to make that transition now. I got to make that transition now. What was that like? And, and talk about life after basketball. Uh, I got to say that part was probably like the downfall. Like that was like my depression stages. You know what I mean? Because you've been mm -hmm. playing basketball your entire life. And this is a lot of guys go through. They play basketball their entire life. And then, they don't know, like, what's the second, what's your second life going to be? You know what I mean? What's your fallback? Like, what you doing next? Like, you got to be prepared. So you got to be prepared. But before you know, like, two or three years ahead, when you know you're about to retire, you got to be starting to get interested in something. So you have that fallback. You have that second life you got to depend on. Mm -hmm. So when I came after 2013, in my head, I always knew I kind of wanted to coach, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. Coach Calhoun used to tell me, yeah, you can coach, you're going to be a great coach. But I didn't really take it in, into my brain, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I always knew I had to come back and graduate, basically, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, to be a coach. And I always wanted to make my mother proud. So I was like, all right, let me get back. Let me, I'm done. Let me go back to school, get finished my degree, you know what I'm saying? And then I'll figure out what I got to do there. So when I came back after 2013, I came back. It was just like a humbling experience for me because I was just overseas. I was the man. I had the cars, the money. I'm doing everything. Here, I'm back on the couch, going to classes with 21-year-olds. Like, my life was just totally different. So it was just like a humbling experience for me, you know. I was working at a little factory up to school. They had got me a little job. So my life was just... Like, it was like a depression stage because I've been playing basketball my entire life, and I just didn't know what I was going to do. So I came back. I got my degree. And and then I'm working at the factory. <laughs> I used to go to the factory, and we used to cut wires at the factory, right? Yeah. I'm saying, I will never do this in my life. Like, this is over. I'm never doing this in my life. I have to find something that I love doing, that I'm passionate about doing, and it doesn't feel like work. So... After I finished up at UConn, I went back to uh, New York City, and I got with my this guy who used to train me, Mark Williams. He used to shout out to me team at, footprint. Shout out to Team Footprint, yeah. Mark Williams. He used to train me at August Martin. I used to go there and get shots with him. So we be, we just develop a, a unique relationship, a very organic relationship. And he just loved the game as much as me. He just, I like, I never have to pay him. I never had to do nothing. Like, he used to just come to the gym and rebound, you know what I mean? And just tell me different things. So we just developed a great relationship. And we just started building team footprints from there on out, you know what I mean? I, I was working out. Then I told my cousin to come work out. Then I told his friend to come work out. And then word of mouth started happening. Then we just started building, building, building. Then before you know it, we had... 300, 400 kids throughout the, throughout the city, you know? No, nah, no question about it. So, you know, you, you brought up a great point. And, you know, I do a lot of work with student athletes, man. And, mm -hmm. you know, basketball, basketball is it. Like, basketball is the magnet. That dream is the magnet for so many of our kids. And I think that, you know, another part that's missing is kids kind of forget that really – 
the reason for going to college is to get the education. Yeah. And I think sometimes the basketball or the football or the whatever the sport is, part of it kind of takes over and we forget. They call us student athletes, but we kind of, that student piece kind of gets overshadowed. And I'm telling you, I've had them all on here. I had Sham on here. I had, yeah. I had Kareem on here. You know what I mean? I had Terrence Wrencher on here. And the biggest thing for me was like, okay, you left college, TJ Ford, but mm -hmm. they all came back yeah. to get that important degree. And you talked about making your mother proud. I'm, I'm the first in my family to graduate. And, you know, I get kids on here listening, kids watching the videos and stuff when I post them. Talk about how important it is and how much the education has meant to you because you're not getting no coaching job at UConn now without that degree. Yeah, no. Uh, we say over here, like, um, college is like an internship, you know what I mean? Just to, mm -hmm. de just to develop you for the real world. That's all mm -hmm. it's doing. It's just an internship developing you for the real world once it's all over, you know what I mean? And when you're here, you got to develop as a man so you could be ready, or, or a lady, so you could be ready for the real world, basically, you know what I mean? You got to be able to handle the real world, because if you don't know what's going on, and you people are going to take advantage of you. You know what I mean? <laughs> people take advantage of dumb people. So you got to be on point. You got to be locked in. You got to know what's going on. No, nah, no question about it. No question about it. So as we, you know, you know, so talk about how you got back to the alma mater and okay. <laughs> the, position where you, the position where you're at right now, because it, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that poll on you. It looks right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it really couldn't be it really couldn't be another school. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. you are, you know, you're UConn basketball and UConn mm -hmm. basketball is you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So talk about the opportunity um to get back to your alma mater. So like I was saying, when I was when we started up the team footprints training program in New York City, we just I just basically stayed at it. You know what I mean? Every single day, just in the gym, just trying to get better at my craft just trying to continue improving, you know what I mean? I wasn't I didn't I wasn't even thinking about coaching cuz at the I'm just a person like at the time, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to just try to master what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So that's what my whole thing. As long as I'm helping the kids, I'm giving back to the kids, kids is learning, kids is developing on the court, off the court. I I'm I'm a hero. I feel great, you know what I mean? Cuz I'm all the information I done learned, now I'm able to get get the information of somebody else so they can receive it. You know what I mean? So I feel great by doing that. I love to give. That's why I'm the all-time assist leader now here because I love to <laughs> I see other people shine. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's no what question. my thing was, you know? <laughs> I love to give. I love, You know what I mean? I love to give back. So uh, I just kept grinding, kept staying at it. We was running after-school programs. We was training some of the top uh, kids in New York City and just Coach Hurley seeing what I was doing. Once Coach Hurley got the job here and uh, Kamani Young, he's basically like my mentor, my guy. We lived in the same building. We grew up together. He like seen me grow up since I was a little kid. I used to take his UTEP shorts. So once he got here with Coach, you know what I mean? They, he threw my name out there. Coach, you know, he agreed with it. And they just gave me a great opportunity now. So now I'm here. I'm just – being a uh, being like a sponge, being like a fly on the wall. I'm learning from uh, some great coaches, and I'm just improving every single day. Like you can never, you can no never stop learning. You know what I mean? Every single day, I learn something new. Like you can never stop learning. Nah, you have to no continue doubt. to grow and push yourself and continue to evolve. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And talk about your talk about your um, your position as player development, because I think people always think player development. Yes. is on court work. Yes. But describe your role to them because, like I said, like people get caught up in the basketball stuff, but it's the off-the-court stuff that's just as important. Talk about your role at UConn. So my role at UConn is player development. And, um, like, we're not – we're on a non-coaching staff, so I'm administration, so we're not able to be on the court. So only people that could be on the court right now, uh, really, is the four main coaches. So my job as player development is to just give guys that great college experience that I had, make sure they're doing the right thing, make sure they're going to classes, taking care of their business, and just 
like I've been saying, continue to grow and continue to learn and develop as a man. So once they leave here, they will be ready for society, basically. You know what yeah. I mean? So guys coming in, guys, you know, they want to get things that they can't tell coach. They come in and tell me. I might sit down with them, talk to them, see what's going on, just making sure they're on the right path. I'm just constantly in these guys' ear every single day, just trying to push them and just trying to keep going. You know what I mean? Continue to go at their goals and continue to work for what they got have to accomplish. Nah, no question about it. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. So as we get ready to wrap this thing up, man, um, I want to hit you with some. Um, I want to hit you with some quick hitters. So I want you to tell me, high school, Ooh. and then college. Your toughest opponent. Oh, high school. I would probably have to say probably the two guards, Omar Cook and Andre Barrett, because we basically had battles. I don't know if I could choose two of them, but, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, not no and question. Then, uh, college, probably um, Troy Bell. He always gave me a run because he, like, yes. he was like the player of the year in the Big East during yes. the time. He had the buzz. So when I played against him, I used to always want to be on have my A game. You know what I mean? So probably but Troy Bell for college. DC. But but hold on, but professional. When I was in Croatia and we went to Sylvania to play, right? Uh huh. This is when Drogic was six, seventeen years old. I didn't know who Drogic was. Anything. <laughs> he destroyed me, and we lost the game. We was the best team in Croatia, Zagreb. So that's the that's the best team in Croatia. Right. But we went to Sylvania, played against Dragic. Oh man, he destroyed me at 17, 18 years old. So from that, that day on, I knew who he was. Lefty, <laughs> 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 lefty cat, man. Wow. Listen, man. Yes. Whoa, that's crazy. Going Dragic. Crazy. <laughs> crazy. Toughest, toughest environment. Toughest environment in college, college basketball. College basketball. Toughest environment. I gotta say the rack, Rutgers. It was, it was brutal to play there. Oh, horrific to play at Rutgers, the rap. Okay, okay. I definitely wasn't expecting that. Yeah, nobody place. expecting that. Nobody ever expect that, but it's an intense place to play. Interesting. Okay, I'll take that. We talked about the shot. We talked mm -hmm. about the national championship game. Yeah. Most exciting games you played in? Mm. Probably the the uh, Big East Championship when I hit the shot. I get, well, I'm just saying this, the National Championship, Big East Championship, and I got to say probably just uh, when we went to North Carolina and we played at North Carolina because I just know we wasn't playing against the ACC schools and just like the, it was just so electric in the building, you know. The court was jumping, rumbling from the fans, going crazy. So it was just, it was just a great environment to play in. Nice. And so I got to hit you with this. Mm -hmm. Top five. Ooh. Top five point guards, New York City, all time. All time? Now, always, I say all time, and I always say it's your opinion. So there is no wrong answers when it's your opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just don't Give want me. people thinking I'm delusional or something. Like that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's Talik Brown. Okay. Talik Brown's top five point guards. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? New York City. New York City. So I'll probably have to go with Tiny Archibald. Okay. Kenny Anderson. Yes, sir. Uh, Stephon Marbury. Mm. Rod Strickland. Woo! And Kimba Walker. He better win tonight. Kimba better win tonight. Then I can add him to my list, man. He better win tonight. <laughs> he, he, he better he better do he something tonight. Win the night, man. Better do something tonight, man. Yeah, he gotta do something tonight. <laughs> and I'll take Kimber Walker. Nice. Now I love that. I love that list, man. So listen, man, when it's all said and done, my, mm -hmm. your playing days are already behind you, and you've now coached in your last game, you're done. How does Talik Brown want to be remembered? That's a good question, man. Great question. I just, I guess, gotta say, I gotta say for that, probably just somebody that 
just love to help other people, you know, love to give. I'm not, I'm not a taker. I'm not going to continue to just take, 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 take. I'm going to work my butt off and continuously just try to give and help other people out. That's what I want to be known as, just like a helper, man. Love it. I love it, man. Well, yo, we got it done, man. We got it done. I'm so yeah. happy we got it. I'm so happy we got it done, man. And I, I appreciate you coming on here, man, and, and giving me your time and, mm -hmm. and, and sharing with me, man. Got so much respect for you, man, and so so happy for you where you are right now and you got so much more to go, man. Like, mm -hmm. definitely going to be a coach in this game one day, man. And when this thing get really, really right, yeah, I'm yeah. going to get up the stores. <laughs> I told Kamani I'm going to get up uh -huh. the stores. I got to get up there, man. I got to get up there and check y'all out, man. Leak, man, blesses, man. Hope you and your Thank family you. stay safe, man, and we'll be in touch. Same to you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you, man. Definitely. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. All right, now. All right. Have a good night. You too. All right.